Well, I think we started to, to look at uh, sort of a soft, very soft kind of uke, and then and then transitioning in the same movement into into an attacking strike, right? And um, I think those those are really interesting movements um, where we're we're trying to get the defensive and the attacking movement together in one movement. Because actually, you know, our style is is sort of built on that principle, right? Our first yeah. Our first kata has, has that uke and striking together movement, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and also obviously a lot of our traditional you, kata have that as well. But if it feels like a lot of the stuff we're doing is also, there's a real strong connection uh, with uh, Naihanshi. Am I perceiving that correctly? Yeah. Um, these uke really yeah, feel very so. Naihanshi like, um, you know, just here yeah. and then coming in or something it feels very very nahanshi like yeah yeah i would I absolutely absolutely agree yeah um i think uh yeah i mean a lot of the teachers they definitely base a lot of their fundamental movements on like positions in nahanshi mm -hmm. or um transitions or movements in nahanshi um so yeah um that, that definitely comes through um i think Sometimes it's just about almost the degree of like hardness and softness they have in their technique and the way they do it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Arakaki Sensei tends to look at Naihanji more for like the destructive power, right? Kind of like being able to, when you want to, put sort of smashing power, destructive power into into the Naihanji positions, right? Um, mm -hmm. Nakasone Sensei tends to focus more on like kind of being very very soft and um, more sort of flowing from one position to another. Um, I've noticed that other teachers, are, they're all kind of on that spectrum, right? Between kind of um, kind of using the hardness of it, using the, the softness of it, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, let's just do, let's run through some, some techniques, explore some stuff. Okay. Um, so we'll, just, we'll just we'll just do some kind of basic movements to uh, to warm up. Yeah, we'll just do our kind of um, moving basics. So we we'll start with uh, Junziki. Ni, san, shi, go, bang. Ni, san, shi, go. Ni, san, shi, go, yan, ich, ni, san, shi, go. So, when we're doing this movement, I'm always, I'm always thinking when I'm doing this movement that I'm, I'm kind of cutting inside the guard. So this is, you know, basic for Kyukatechi Bunkai movement, right? So I'm always thinking that I'm working against. The other guy's guard. The other guy's guard is here. This guard's going to come out, basically, kind of like a like a triangle shape, right? So I want to, although I'm going in, I actually want to cut cut in from my shoulder width to the center. But it's not it's not a it's not a case of the hands kind of just going up to that position. I want to cut in cut into that position. The tricky thing is not to let the elbow flare out and do this kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about here, yeah, cutting in, in and down, right? So you end up in kind of like this two down position, but you've gone, yeah, cutting in. So you could you could be behind your your shoulder and tuck your chin in if you really if you really need to, right? From this position, you're not far away from 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 this position, right? So. I was thinking, always thinking about basics as being, they kind of teach us where we need to end up, but how we get there, I think there's a diff few different ways you could do it, right? You still end up in the right position. You know, we don't want to end up like this, yeah, because we're overextended, right? We want to end up in that kind of that square position so that we're stable and our shoulders not exposed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, we're not exposed this way. Um, so, what I'm just thinking about. And I'm imagining, imagining that I've actually got someone in front of me, yeah? I'm still going to basically work on the same line, but I'm going to be 
cutting, cutting inside, cutting, cutting inside, yeah, yeah. And then, in my imagination, it really depends on the size of the person about whether I end up going like inside and underneath their arm or cutting in over the top and like coming in, coming in over, over the shoulder and into the chin, right? So, you know, um, generally when I'm working with people, they're usually smaller than me. And so, um, naturally, when I'm doing this inspiring, I end up probably going over the top, over the top of people's guard more than I go underneath. But, you know, it varies on the, depending on the person. Yeah. Um, well, do, I mean, when you're doing, uh, when you're doing Junzuki or when you're doing those positions, if you've got itchy, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, same thing. I'm, I'm always trying to, I'm always trying to work on the concept of the block strike. Um, uh, when it's to uh, Chudan, I'm really always trying to stop myself from over-focusing on blocking with the outside of the elbow, as you just pointed out, and really instead trying to yeah. really go right under there um, without getting too much of the shoulder yeah. involved. So it's the same concept you're talking about. This is very helpful to remind myself. Yeah. There's this, there's this kind of this screw screw motion, right? There's this screw motion, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, again, at the end of our at the end of our punching position, we end up with in, in seiken, yeah, like we end up level. But that doesn't mean that we we couldn't have kind of gone in and then come back to that position, right? That's our finishing position. So mm -hmm. I kind of think about this almost like this uh, corkscrew kind of entry, right? I'm I wanna I wanna kind of corkscrew into my target, dig right in there, and then, but but not lose my stability, yeah? So, you know, if I'm thinking about going inside, even if I'm thinking about going inside somebody's guard or outside somebody's guard, even if I'm going outside and going down into the ribs here, so from here, here, it's still, it's still Junzuki, right? It's just that mm -hmm. I've, I've aligned, I've just angled myself vis-a-vis -vis them, but I'm, I'm still basically still doing Junzuki stuff. But I want to, I want to drive in, and this is where, uh, you know, particularly in Gojiru uh, and Uechiru, right, there's a lot of the Yipong Ken left in it. You know, particularly when they're ex executing their kata, there's lots and lots of, most of it is Yipong Ken, actually. Seiken, actually, for example, in it, Uechiru, there was no Seiken, I'm told, in the original kata. They didn't even, they didn't have a Seiken position, right? It was all like open fingers, open hands, Boshi Ken, or or um, Ippon Ken, right? So basically, when I, you know that that kind of like, almost like drilling a hole mm -hmm. into the into the target, yeah, yeah. And um, so when, I think it's kind of useful because if you start to do that, then you actually start to extend extend your uh, Junzuki position, and then mm -hmm. almost spring back elastic, right? Yeah, that kind of yeah. that it's almost like you're poking a hole, right? Poke the hole and extend, and then you're going to come back. So <clears throat> we do like maybe just run through the Junzuki again, and just do those with Ippon Ken. Mm -hmm. So we've so got an arc, and then you know almost coming in like this, and then coming back to the position, right? Mm -hmm. Also, you are working in, in uh, obviously when we're doing basics, we're pulling the other hand back into Hikate. And uh, well, even when we're doing basics, when that hand going back into Hikate has a, has a role as well, right? If you've, if, you've driven, if you've driven your hand in to hit them or into their guard, very likely their hands have come down to try and intercept or to deal with that hand you've driven in, right? So when that hand comes out, it can be hooking, right? It can be hooking to open a space. Mm -hmm. If I go to, to punch into your center, you're very likely to cover, yeah, or cover, cover, right? So I, when I drive in, yeah, this one is kind of opening. If my guard's here, yeah, I can be using this hand to pry open a space 
mm -hmm. to get the other one in, right? Yeah. You have to pry open and get inside, right? So that's kind of the other thing that I think isn't, isn't immediately apparent in a basis of Hikate, but, um, but I think we want to kind of have that awareness, right? Of first one comes in, pulls their guard down to it, and then we use that to open the guard and then, and then draw it in. Um, I know, and I tend to think that our Gyakuzuki is very much along the same lines, right? Because uh, you know, we drive the Gyakuzuki in, but then we don't immediately pull it back, right? We keep it forward and then drive the other one in, right? So we want to keep that one forward and, and the pressure going in. So if we, we just run through a few Gyakuzukis. Yeah, but you I always find it interesting to see uh, Lueru, you know, Sakamoto Sensei's karate, Lueru. Mm -hmm. And they have that, I think it's Anan Kata, I don't really know the Kata well, but they have that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They do this kind of circular palm from the extended hand, right? That hands out, and then they sort of palm off before driving in the next hand. And I always think about that, that adaptation, that modification in our Gyakuzuki, yeah? Because we're basically doing the same thing. We're stepping forward and pushing. And if you think about it, you know, what are we pushing? We're pushing them with our hand and just making space to get through, you know? Mm, very nice. Either to their inside or even to get behind, right? We come in Gyakuzuki here and maybe what we're doing is here is the opportunity to go behind there their shoulder here, right? So as we come in, hit, and now we want to look to go under underneath their opposite shoulder, get behind and outside that shoulder, and then yeah, then and hit again. Right? Mm. Well, again, what, what, what do you what do you think about Gyakuzuki? I mean, do you? Look at it in a particular way in terms of like the application or when 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 would you use it the appropriateness of it well it, it just seems to me it's always it's always felt like um because of that front that front arm is really such a beautiful mm. blocking um position mm. um that kind of what you're saying first of all you got for me it generates about 10 times more hip than any other move um so this idea of, of being able to block and then punch, which is why it seems it's in, um, you know, so many of the, uh, uh, the Yaksuku Kumates as well, um, because it's an easy way to draw attention to one spot and then punch, or once that space is created, go to the other spot. At least that's the way I've always perceived it. I mean, my understanding of, of actual Kumite and fighting is such a uh, surface because we really never focused on it at all. Um, so I'm I'm trying to make associations from what I'm learning here uh, to the the kata uh, uh, exploration that I've done. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting, Gyakuzuki. Um, I mean, uh, I've spoken so I've uh, encountered some. Uh, Chinese uh, Kenpo systems, Chinese Kung Fu systems, that don't have a, a Gyakuzuki as such. In fact, some of them have said that when they see Karate Gyakuzuki, they're like, no, that's, that's not a good way to punch. It's not a, they, they tend to punch, have, you know, they don't want to basically kind of reverse the hand and the foot forward, right? They see that as a, as a kind of a weak, potentially a weak compromising position. So it's kind of interesting to me to think about like where Gyakuzuki came from, how it developed, because it became, you know, a real fundamental of karate, but I don't, I wonder if it was always there in karate, because if we look at Naihanshi Kata, there's no Gyakuzuki, right? Right. Um, if we look at Kushanku Kata, 
there's no Gyakazuki. No. Uh, I see. Am I right? If I don't, we look I don't at Passai Kata. Do. Yeah. We look at Passai Kata. Yeah. Again, there's no <laughs> Yakazuki as such. Yeah, we do we do have some some positions where we kind of go off to the angle, but there's mm -hmm. there's no Yakazuki. Where do we see something that's similar to that? Maybe Goju Shiho, right? Goju Shiho for sure, that whole sequence. Yeah. So Goju Shiho, which is kind of we start to see something that looks a bit like Yakuzuki, but it's not just Yakuzuki, right? It's a, it's a clear, yeah, it's a clear, right? it's a compound movement and Yakuzuki is kind of the, the back half of it, right? Yeah. Um, when do we see Yakuzuki really start to appear? Well, it seems to be the Pinan cutters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, I mean, uh, or we look at maybe, uh, Wankan, you know, mm -hmm. Wankan. Oh, yeah. We have, you know, we have, you know, kick, kick, yeah, Jakazuki, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, if Gakazuki as a, as a fundamental position evolved out of more compound movements and became, you know, isolated. Yeah. But maybe, it's maybe it was. It was Maybe it was this all the time, it was, and then and then it just became this. Yeah, exactly. It, it it seems to me. I mean, we we were just working on this last night. Interesting. We were working on Wankan, um, and then also mm -hmm. on uh, which is really one of my favorite drills, the block and punch, yeah. um, as well as yeah. the shuto punch, which is also yakuzuki, but out of a out of a shuto, mm -hmm. and it always involves a block first. So it really always involves a combination block punch, um, and uh, and that's where I find the real validity of the the, the yakuzuki. It's the clearing first, as you say, and then coming right in with that same hip movement. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where I I I, um, I like to look at yakuzuki as as more part of a a compound movement, right? Um, so one thing that I like to practice here, it, it, it's kind of a, an additional set of basics, is kind of compound uh, uke and striking, uke and striking movements. Um, kind of inspired by these compound movements that we have in Kujishiho, uh, in uh, Chinto. Chinto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, there's, so there's kind of a three sets that I tend to work through uh, based on Jodan uke, Chudan uke, and uh, Gedan Balai. And um, yeah, so basically, um, this movement here, 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 right? So basically, Joda Nuke and Tateke, Tateke, because the range is you don't need to, if you've done Joda Nuke, right, then you're, they're, they're here, yeah? So Tateke, because you don't need to overextend, right? I go all the way in. So, uh, so if you want to kind of just practice that movement, basically, I mean, this is kind of similar to um, to Chinto, right? So we're in one movement, we want the uke and the punch, and then the hands stay there, right? They're our front guard, yeah? And then from there, this one's going to pass off, this one up, here, here, here. We turn, same thing, cover, punch. This hand's in front, this hand's in front. This is like my high guard, right? Uh, my high guard. So with my high guard, I'm kind of opening a window here, yeah? I'm saying, okay, you're gonna hit me, you can hit me through this window, right? My other hand's down here, protecting my center, mm -hmm. center line, right? There's no need for hiki, right? If I keep my hand here or here, then I'm more likely to maybe get a punch come over the top or even a low one. So I hold it up in sort of Jodanuki position I'm basically signaling that there's a window right here. So there's a good chance that whatever's coming through, I'm going to be able to catch here, get behind, and then probably hit into the ribs or into the center. So here. So this is actually like an uchi uke, a toshi uchi uke, 
but the position, the opening and finishing, or is kind of Joe Danucchi, right? So, for me, uh, yeah. question, James. Uh, the uh, the actual yeah. um, the actual punch on there, it doesn't ever come to the chamber. It doesn't need to, right? You mean pull it back? Yeah. No. It doesn't need to. I don't. I really don't want to take it away from my center line. I either want to have it attacking their center line or back protecting my center line. Mm. Yeah. There's no reason for me to pull it off of my center line. The only reason that I would do that is if I was extending them, their arm, across my center line, and I was literally, you know, arm barring them or shoulder barring them, like across me. Yeah, but, but so, so here, like, I'm like, okay, so, I mean, I'm not gonna stand here all day like this, obviously, right? <laughs> Although it's interesting, you will see some full contact fighters who, who fight like this, yeah? Really? Because they're kind of trying to encourage the attacking to happen in one zone, right? Mm. So they've got a better chance of dealing with it, right? You know, if you kind of do this, yeah, yeah, it kind of is encouraging the, the, the attacking zone to be here, right? Mm. If you, you know, if you do this, then you're not going to get attacks into the center, right? They're going to come up around. So, so it's kind of interesting this position, I think, of um, hand here, that you're going to try to catch everything that comes through here, yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah attack. Here. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then one of the things at the end, at the end of that, is to then drive again, to drive in with the knuckle, right? The ipon ken. Ipon so that ken. could be could be the extended finger, or it could just be that that first index finger mm -hmm. knuckle where the finger goes into the hand. But try when you have the tatiken, then just like we do in in like pina nida, pina nida, uh, dropping. Yeah. Using just the weight of the fist to drop in. Yeah. Right. So if I'm somebody, I've covered, I've got behind, then this and it's interesting then that this Gyakazuki movement, this Gyakazuki position allows the hip to move in and, and down a bit, right? So kind of hitting in down through the through the solar plexus, and I can use my and put my weight, my weight behind it. So, like you said, the Gyakazuki position strength is that you can put a lot of a lot of force and weight behind it, right? Oh yeah. So, but how do you get in there? Yeah, because it's not a dis. I mean, obviously, some some in some karate, some karate fighters have got an extremely fast Gyakazuki, but mechanically, the Gyakazuki has a worse range and extent than Junzuki, right? So with Gyakazuki, you've got to have a strategy to get in range. Sure. Either you let them come into you, or you know you find a way in past them, right? So that's why I think the combination movement, yeah, it helps you to get a path, a path in. That's um, great. The um, so then with Chudan, okay, kind of a similar idea is that with, you know, so this is like very similar to kind of the male to day position that we. You know the husband and wife hands kind of position that we have in mm -hmm. our in our in our kata, right? You know, in our older kata. Um, <clears throat> we're just about interesting. We're just about to publish the seminar with uh, Nakasone Sensei, the, the the third one that he did on Pinan. Um, where Chris and I have been putting the subtitles on that, and um, what he's talking about in terms of sort of the uh, the evolution of uh, the the male today position. Even with the, within the understanding of Okinawan teachers over the past three generations, you know what what is the secret of kind of husband and wife hands, right? Um, and you know, essentially, what one of the things he brings to light is that husband and wife hands is more like this: you have the husband and the wife together. Mm -hmm. But in the execution of techniques from this position, almost this kind of you know prayer position. Which is called uh, uh, in Okinawan is called ugami. It means literally the prayer position, ugami. Um, then you can transition to a number of, of different number of different positions where the hands are working together in 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 unison, kind of like husband and wife, right? But, mm. but he, he he says that actually the the base husband and wife hands position is 
is like this, Ugami, which is kind of interesting. In fact, it's very interesting. Um, you know, in terms of like, you know, where where do the, where where do these positions tra transition to? You know? Yeah. Is this a uh, question for you, James? Uh, this is uh, one of the very interesting um, trainings I had when I was over there was with uh, Miyagi Sensei, um, who was very uh, cognizant, it seemed, of this hun husband and wife hands, this idea, especially coming from uh, augmented chest block idea of really the use of both yeah. hands, one block, one punch. Is that, uh, I was having trouble understanding yeah. him, but it was fascinating. Is that what he's getting at? Mm. Have you worked yeah, with him on so. that? You mean when you say which, which Miyagi do you mean? Uh, um, uh, eighth degree uh, WMK in Naha. Um, I think he's in his oh, okay. uh, mid 80s now. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, Miyagi says, yeah, okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think very much he's saying the same thing about the hands working together. So, um, so yeah, so the, the, so the movement, you know, here, mm -hmm. here. Again, we've got we got the front. The front hand is is the hand that's going to do the UK first, right? That, that makes sense. Right. We use that first. Yeah. We wouldn't put it away and use something. Yeah. So the front hand, if you're in your basic male today position, where again no hikite, right? The hands, the rear hand is protecting your center line. Yeah. Growing face, growing face, and this hand is kind of catching. Yeah. Right. So whenever they come in, you're going to be looking to make a line either outside of their guard or inside of their guard, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and then transition to a position of control, right? So if you have the ability then to move from here, here, and then strike, right? Here, here, strike, yeah? So, yeah, yeah. So the movement then is, is first this, this movement, so this is your, your front hand, yeah? This movement, right? Then this one. Obviously, you wouldn't wave it at them, but just to illustrate, this is your cover for the thing that, first thing that's coming in, right? Yeah, here, yeah. Okay. Here. So this is... The elbow, the elbow is kind of, you know, is floating in front of this position, right? So it's, the elbow is one fist in front of your body, but it, it's sort of attached by a, by a, you know, invisible thread, you know? Mm -hmm. So the elbow is not coming away from here. Things are happening, rotating. Yeah, even when you come down here, yeah, the elbow is still basically sitting in front of that head position, yeah? Mm -hmm. So from there, Right. So, you know, sequence of those. Start with male today position. It's me, Sam, she, make four, go, it's, that's, cute, do that. Naturally, normally I wouldn't do it going backwards, but just, you know, <laughs> it's me. Mm. That's really nice. That mm. has uh, really reminds me a lot of uh, Chinese. Um, this reminds me a lot of Chinese uh, martial arts as well. These these circling hands. Yes. Yes, I think. And I see when I when I my feeling uh, about uh, Tamarite is that Tamarite had you know retained a lot of that movement from. Uh, Chinese forms. I mean, okay. Uh, it's also First possible time. there were some other. Other. Yeah. Sorry, my phone. My phone thought we were a... talking at it. Hold on a second. <laughs> Turn off my phone. <laughs> Mine does that too. <laughs> the other thing I, the, where you see the, this kind of stuff is when you look at, say, Southeast Asian martial arts. So if you look at, say, uh, Silat, or even if you look at um, the older forms of uh, from uh, Thailand, uh, the Mubaran, 
then you see you see a lot of you know movements where the the two hands are moving together and this is kind of composite sliding circular movements as well and i actually think that and this is something that has been speculated on by patrick mccarthy and other teachers too is that um our karate probably has a huge amount of influence uh, an input from Southeast Asian martial arts, but it's just not documented to the same extent that the Chinese, the activity between China and, and Okinawa was documented. Um, but um, uh, I suspect that there's there's a, there's a very, very, very strong overlap there. Okay, so um, the other thing though is, is like when we're doing these movements is like trying to connect the hip, the hip movements together, yeah? So what we want to do is try and get these movements to happen as kind of one, on a one count. So at the moment, we're still kind of doing one, two, right? One, two. Mm -hmm. But really what we want to do is get these movements here, yeah, that, to happen on one beat. Um, yeah. The, the, the challenging thing there is that if we stiffen up on the front, then we lose um, our ability to to um, to uh, manage our angle against them on the fly, right? So if we stiffen up, we just end up, <clears throat> we haven't really lost our ability to pivot against their angle. Whereas what we want to try and retain is, yeah, that, that there's that kind of sensitivity there. This is going to be the first thing that, that makes contact, yeah? And their line of force, very likely obviously headed for our center. If we lock up, then we're just going to go force on force, right? So we need to be able to yeah, have that kind of um, softness, that kind of sensitivity. Yeah, that kind of softness, sensitivity. Um, so let's give it a try. Let's try and do the um, that kind of simultaneous movement, but still retain the um, sort of the uh, tie back a little bit of twisting as well. It's okay? That's really, to me, that's just well, absolutely fascinating. We were just talking last night about augmented chest locks and how really right. you don't need uh, two hands to do a chest lock. <laughs> and so obviously the inside hand yeah. is to be used in a different manner. Um, and I was mainly talking about this idea of coming up, but it makes just as much sense yeah. and more sense even to clear a spot and to be able to use any height on this attack at the same time. Really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> one of, one of, one of, I think one of karate's strengths, and this is one of the reasons why karate spread so well, maybe compared to other martial arts, was that the, the sort of the systemization and the linear, the linear nature that was given to it when it was sort of adapted to the to the Japanese university system, right? It became uh, very much broken down into basic component parts, and and things were aligned literally along straight lines, right? Mm -hmm. And we retain that to this day. We do our basics in straight lines, um, and um, often our kata, our kata also. Has become arranged along straight lines. Yeah, very much so, right? Um, and um, that means that it's kind of easy to uh, replicate uh, and work in a big group and coordinate movement if everybody's basically working along a straight line. You know, you start here, you finish there, uh, that sort of thing. But we also know that that creates some paradoxes, some great paradox, right? For example, in our kata. Um, we almost always move forward when we're doing uke. Mm. Yeah, we, we almost never move backwards. We never move backwards in a, almost never move backwards in a kata and do uke, right? Right. But when we're working in straight lines, we very soon hit a point where 
we have to do that or else it doesn't work right you know one person has to move forward attacking and the other person has to defend you know and you can have people stepping back attacking but that starts to feel even less real right why would anybody do that yeah right they don't when they're attacking they come forward so so because of the the linear so the training methodology that was imposed on karate, we have all of these, these like seeming scratch your head kind of paradoxes, right? What is, why? It doesn't make sense. Right? And what's interesting is that, um, but in our shoring route, we also have uh, positions which are angular, yeah? So obviously in our kata, we are taught to, we reposition ourselves, you know, at 45 degrees or 90 degrees to where we were. Um, but when we're also doing um, nekoashi, then, we, we, it's an angular movement and we, we end up making a shape, which is like a wedge, like a wedge shape. Yeah? Um, and again, when we're taught Ekwashi, we sort of taught to just do it forward in a straight line. Um, but sometimes, some of the dojos Nokinawa will then teach you to offset, yeah, yeah. and actually use um, Nagashi on anime. What's interesting yeah, to me is that is that a lot of the other Asian martial arts share this kind of the idea of like using like the mandala mm -hmm. with a triangle, yeah? So they'll, they'll draw a triangle on the floor, right? And your movements are relative to, you know, to the, to the triangle, right? Um, or you're moving, you're moving, usually it's kind of like a, like uh, eight directions, right? Eight directions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's more. So usually you're moving around the angle and the various angles for eight directions. And um, I wonder if that's something that we kind of lost from karate is that idea of learning from an early point to work the angles and to understand kind of, you know, that you can split, you can split things into quadrants and work around the quadrant. Mm. Um, like when I'm, when I'm, you worked uh, on that uh, Yaksuku Kumite, the three person, you did that three person Yaksuku Kumite, um, where really you're yeah. dealing with angles and turning. And that was fascinating. But I noticed there was a, a, a geometric configuration to what you were doing. You had to because it was a drill, it was preordained. And so it couldn't just be free form anywhere, right? Yeah. But that was very interesting. Now, those are triangles, weren't you working? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're working, you know, um, exactly with um, people positioned at. Actually, in that, in that drill, it was, we did it in threes, right? So you've got one person here, one person here, one person here. So you're working mm -hmm. in a triangle. Um, yeah. And um, what we wanted to illustrate with that was how you would position from the first person and the technique, how you would then position for the next person. And that the Yakuza Kumite can be looked at as setting you up to deal with the angles right so in the one where so in our yakuza kumite we have that one where we appear to turn our back on the person and walk away and they come up and clap us on the back and we spin around and we deal with it yeah um and um we did that one um more naturally in that you know when you deal with with that one person you come up with the angle which has put you away from the other person, right? So um, I think trying to build that into our karate is pretty important. Um, when I'm working, uh, uh, let's say, how to use shuto to um, move around a person, um, when we start uh, facing that person, yeah, we look to uh, either move in an angle inside their guard, but we usually try to get to the first kind of, if we think about, uh, six segments, right? They're in the center. We're at the front segment. Usually, we want to try and get to the outside of their attacking arm first, right? Most of our techniques, we try to get to the outside of their attacking arm, mm. and we end up, but we don't end up immediately behind them. We end up usually at sort of an angle to them to their front, yeah. And then very quickly, though, if we want to get into a safe zone, we have to we have to get to the the rear segment at an angle to them. Then we have the ability to um, apply an arm lock, sweep, take down, attack the back of the head, that sort of thing. So I think that there in our karate, you know, we have 
we have that, you know, that first segment, second segment, mm. kind of, you know, um, yeah. angular, angular progressive sort of movement. Yeah, interesting. Uh, um, a lot of the Yaksuku Kumite um, variations that uh, I was taught by, by my teacher, Sensei Masters, he I spoke to him and he was taught those by Hishiki Sensei. And almost all the variations yeah. involve uh, Taisabaki. So, uh, you know, for instance, the one where we're walking back, one, two, three, the variation is stepping all the way around to get to the side. So as opposed yeah, to yeah, turning yeah. and going straight, it's actually using this foot to create a yeah. semicircle and blocking and punching at the same time, one move. And that's the variation for our number four, Yaksuku Kumite. Oh. And that's from Hishiki Sensei. So it, it, yeah. it, it you know, came from a, a little while ago. It's kind of what you're yeah, talking yeah. about. Yeah, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense, interesting. So, um, so one of the reasons, you know, I sort of brought that up at that point was, um, um, you know, talked about this Joda Nuke, Chuda Nuke. When it comes to doing Geidan Barai, I think Gedan Barai really, really it relies on the angles, yeah. Because if you just if you just do Gedan Barai in a straight line, you're basically just moving straight into the line of force, right? It's a very dangerous place to be, um, and uh, that doesn't make sense from a, from a from a from a common sense perspective, yeah. So mm -hmm. when I'm thinking about Gedan Barai, but I think about also the comp the composite movement right here, yeah, here. This composite movement. So rather than the hand staying hikite, the hand coming forward from the center line and striking upwards. Yeah, basically just rising up into the chin, into the face. Yeah. So that's fine. But if you do that in a if you do that in a straight line, then it's kind of like two two freight trains bashing, <laughs> smashing into each other, right? So yeah. when I'm doing this. I'm thinking about okay. So what am I? What am I dealing with here? I'm still probably still dealing with probably not. Maybe I'm dealing with a kick, but actually you're probably still dealing with a punch that's coming into the upper area. Yeah. So this this motion, this is the uke here, right? And when, I, when that punch is coming in, I'm gonna divert it off. Yeah, I want to divert myself off the front off of that straight line and bring their energy forwards and down. Right. So get down but I mechanically takes my weight forwards and down. Yeah. Mm. So I yeah. can use my forwards and down to direct them forwards and down. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. That's so really I'm thinking, okay, so wow. So I look at gay down but I so I look at gay down but I as being the finishing point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because in Japanese, geidan barai means low low level sweep, or geidan uke means low level receive. Either way, it, it implies it can imply movement as much as it implies a position. You know, sweep implies a movement. Uke implies a movement, right? Not just a not just a stop, not just a, 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 a static position. So, as as do all of our uke, right? So. So here, this one, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I've got I've got a line a line of force coming in, probably coming in at my head, very likely. Yeah. I want to want to come outside that and re redirect it down, and then jab in at the head as the head comes down, right? Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So if we do that, that's kind of a line drill, but we're going to need to put, put the angles on it as well. Right? So we're going to step forward here, 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 here. So now I'm thinking about, I'm working to the outside, right? So I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking at my mirror and thinking, okay, this guy's coming in with a big right hand. Mm -hmm. right? Big right hand, yeah. So he's coming in with a big right hand right into here yeah i'm in my soft ready to receive position yeah and i just want to catch that redirect it 
down and away from me, right? Drive in, yeah? Mm. And then for, just for the sort of basic practice, obviously you're gonna do that on, on both sides, yeah? Drive in and the weight down, right? Um, As a drill, also, it kind of makes sense from a continuous perspective. As yeah. a drill, when you do this drill, when, show me which leg you move. So the first one I fully understand. Boom, here, uh, here. Now that I'm in this position, which yeah. leg do I move, the back leg or the front leg? Sure. Okay, so let's say I've, I've let in with my left. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've got my left leg forward, left, right. Well then, yeah, yeah. this hand, this hand is my forward hand. This one is the one that's up, it's in the central position where the next attack is likely to come. So this is mm -hmm. gonna become my leading hand, right? And yep. if the center, the center, the attack's coming to my center line, it follows my center line, and I again need to rotate around my center line. So you're going to um, do your gain and uke with your front right hand, your right hand. Right. Is that your right but hand? which leg do yeah, I move and then first? rotate around that. Yeah, so here, yeah, here, here, yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, 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 I got it. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's kind of um, probably you trying to get to the outside, right? Get to the outside and then end up with them kind of sideways onto you. But I mean, sometimes you're gonna end up on the inside, right? So, and if that's the case, then, uh, if that's the case, then it might be that, you know, they've led with their left, and they're gonna pull that one down, and then their head's gonna be somewhere here, right? Shoulder barge, shoulder barge, possibility in there as well. Yeah, so mm. from here, right? If you're in there here, then their head is about there, right? Mm -hmm. So when they move again, yeah, yeah, slapping, hitting, slapping, hitting their head, or pulling it down, yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, question for you, James, um, regarding this uh, this concept. Um, really, I, I'm I'm trying to work on uh, something Tyra Sensei worked with me on last year which is this idea of really twisting on these downward blocks, you know, this exercise that he loves here. And uh, I'm working with some of my more advanced students who have spent years learning that it's from the shoulder, you know, here from the shoulder. And this makes so much more sense to me. And now talking to you, it feels like this also allows for a, a, a block up here combination with this down here is that all one of the same concept absolutely absolutely i think that the area you're always primarily going to protect is your head is your upper body right that's always going to be the primary target for attack just based on natural human instinct um yes you there are going to be some lower attacks yeah but they're much less common um and there are other strategies in, in uh, Okinawan Karate for dealing with, with low attacks, right? You know, sitting down and squatting, this kind of, this kind of uh, you know, blocking in, in my hanchi, for example, mm. right? Um, so um, you, you, this is the area that you, you, you know, is gonna get the most attacks. And so it's natural that first your hands are gonna be up rather than down, yeah? So this, this, kind of, this kind of thing doesn't happen naturally. Nobody really does that when they're actually in a position of stress. Their hands are up and they're, and they're protecting themselves. Um, and, you know, most of the attacks are going to come to the center line. Even the ones that come around the corner, you know, they're aiming for the center, right? So this here, if somebody throws something at you, if somebody threw something at you, you, you do this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't even do this. Most people would do that, yeah. That's I, I would I would I think, you know, if your hands are sort of around here in a neutral position, and somebody throws a, a rock or throws something at you, you do that, yeah. That's a very very natural reaction. Yeah. Mm. Two things happen, right? One is 
you bat across your face, but also you move off the line that you think the attack is coming down. You just do it naturally. Yeah? yeah. So if this is, uh, this is the basis of the movement, then Gaydan Borai is just about saying, okay, how do, we, how do we build on that natural reaction? Yeah, so that it's not just here and stop, but it's here and redirect, redirect yeah. and then put energy back in the other direction. Right? Yeah. So that's, um, so I, I think, yeah, uh, it comes from the hip, right, as well. So again, when you need to move strong, very powerfully, naturally, you engage your hips. Right. If you need, if you need to lift something, you engage your hips. Right. You engage your legs. You engage your hips. If you need to really push yourself away from something, you engage your hips. Right. People don't do this. Well, maybe they do, but um, that natural move it tends to be. Yeah. You, you move your center of mass away from from the threat. Yeah. From what it is. Right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so, yeah, but, but yeah, basically, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about Joda Nuke, Chuda Nuke, Gidan mm. Borai, um, I tend to think about things in that way. Um, but, you know, learning the best ways to work the angles, I think, is one of the kind of the interesting challenges. Um, I think one of the transitions from, say, doing the basics in karate to being able to use your karate is being able to move away from straight line movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get drilled, drilled into straight line movement, but you've got to, you've got to then be able to kind of move away from that uh, or not get too kind of, you know, um, blinkered by straight line movement. Straight line movement's not a good fighting strategy. No. And I mean, that's just, common to pretty much every martial art. Like, straight line is not a good fighting strategy. Yeah, use the angles, use circles. So that's that's the, you know, almost like a natural transition. If someone actually has to start to use their karate, either, either like a, a dojo, competitive, com you know, even a co cooperative, but competitive kind of kumite situation, or indeed um, in a more um, stressful, uh, you know, violent, violent situation, then that, that becomes apparent quite quickly, the need to use angles and the need to, 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 um, to use circular movement, I think so. This has been fantastic, James. Hey. Like this has been really, really Thanks, clarifying. Really yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's really good that we get the time to talk about this. We couldn't really do this in a bigger kind of class environment, oh, so it's really yeah. nice in a way that we get the opportunity. All right, man. Uh, well, it's it's uh, nine thirty, and I've uh, I've got to say adieu. Yes. Have a great day. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, arigato, Good day. Thank you. Hey, David. Take care of yourself. Thank you, James. Well, uh,